I'm, I'm, thank you. And I'm really honored to have this opportunity to share my thoughts about the energy geopolitics. And let me start from the most important topic these days. This is sanctions. Let me ask you whether 1 billion euro is a lot. Well, I'm sure the majority would say it is. It is the amount of money that the EU has pledged to the military support of Ukraine after a month of war. And we are indeed very thankful for this because it's really a matter of our survival. But what if I ask you about 1 billion euro a day? And this is truly hard to imagine. And this is the amount of money the EU continues to pay daily for the Russian energy supplies. For the months of war, the EU paid Russia 35 billion euro for energy supplies, according to the EU diplomacy chief, Jose Borrell. Unfortunately, today the war is going on uh, more than a month, and the war crimes are committed by Russians almost daily. That's why effective sanctions are number one priority. We have long discussed and talked that Russians were using energy as a weapon. Now it is not a mere metaphor. It makes no sense to try to stop Russian war and at the same time to fuel its army with the energy money. The energy embargo is indeed not a pleasant step. That's understandable. However, it is manageable and feasible, and it is the only way to stop the war, meaning to stop the everyday atrocities. We believe it is better for the whole Europe to stop Russia now and to have peace and security to plan the future energy transition. That is why we're calling for a complete embargo of Russian energy, including pipeline gas, LNG, oil, coal, the longer we wait, the higher the price. And I'm starting with this simply because it's essential for having any further discussion about anything else. This is the step we have to make because we were not quick enough to act in the past. Now we have to learn our lessons. One of them is diversity. By this, I mean a diversity of energy supplies or energy sources. And I also mean a diversity of sources of the gas supply, indeed. The number two item is honesty, including energy honesty, if, if you let me. Calling Nord Stream 1 and 2 a business case was the same as ignoring energy dependency on Russia. One can pretend, but this does not change the matter. Another lesson is illusion of safety. It seemed to us that having the proven oil and gas resources would secure our well-being for years to come, or at least to some of us. Well, these are just to name a few. Let's let's get down to, to looking at what they are. This brings us to the situation we basically find ourselves in today. And this absolutely demands from us to introduce energy embargo against Russia. Fortunately, there is not much time to wait. Basically, no, <laughs> not any time to wait. So we can not plan anymore or try to postpone these decisions. Again, the longer we wait, the smaller is the chance to stop the war. Let me then focus on some issues with energy honesty. It's crucial as we will further head into the global energy transition, discussing or replanning the energy logistics and essentially the energy mix. We saw various energy businesses exit in Russia and we, appreciated indeed their step. However, when we looked at some of the companies, it became evident that their statements were saying quite different things. Some of the statements remain just words. Some companies chose to stop new investments or revision current activities. Still a big number withdrew. We keep hearing stories. Some companies bought Russian oil, bought, sorry, bought Russian oil because it was so lucratively discounted. One company, again, I had decided to mix 49% of Russian oil with 51% of the other oil, and pretend the whole amount suddenly came of non-Russian origin. It shows that 
people have not realized that no business as usual is possible. The longer it takes them to realize that, the higher will be the price again. The price to Europe, as well perhaps the price to the whole world. As these days show, steps could not have been made just over a month ago. Don, can you, uh, there is a little problem with your mic, uh, maybe you can. <clears throat> yeah, sorry about that. So let's talk about the uh, assets. Well, Europe is not only vulnerable because of energy supplies, it also hosts a lot of Russian energy assets. We had a lesson this winter when Russia used its assets and lack of European determination to bring one of the biggest energy prices, price crises. You may remember that some years ago, the EU held the antitrust investigation against Gazprom that basically ended up with the last warning to Gazprom and to the demand to behave properly. Well, Russia clearly failed, failed to even think to do so. In older days, I would suggest that the antitrust investigation should be effectively continued. But now I'm afraid I would urge any EU country hosting Russian energy assets to freeze Russian ownership and to take over management. And this is exactly something that is happening and we partially see them in the UK and perhaps in Germany. But there are many more assets around Europe. And the faster this is done, the more prepared we will come to winter. One more energy honesty thing. During these long years of building business with Russia, Europe saw a lot of consultancies, so-called think tanks, and so-called experts, the PR companies that were save, servicing Russia and pushing uh, Russian messages and narratives through instead of doing the true products. And this is the problem. It is the war time, and there is no place and no time for this kind of approach anymore. This has to be called by this name, and this is the propaganda. No place for this in the post war discussion about any future composition of the energy systems. The discussion has to be now about how to balance the global and supply and what the real energy transition is. The discussion we are to have after war is about the courage not to stop and explore further how can we build a sustainable energy future. And just to end with some positive news, sorry for being that kind of not positive, but. One last thing that I'd like to share with you is that Ukraine has recently joined and became the part of the European Electricity Network, or ENSOE. I know this is not that much of a guess, but it is far more than just electricity grids and their connection. Ukraine is now on the road to effectively become a part of the European energy market of gas and electricity. We first expect the commercial trade to be opened, and hopefully we can, we can heal the wounds in our electricity sector. Many of you have probably heard that there are some problems in the operation as well. As mentioned, I'm going to focus on um, particularly your, uh, the situation from the perspective of Europe's gas problem. This is not a new problem, and we've gotten ourselves into this situation over the course of decades. Um, so to my mind, we have three intersecting crises right now. Obviously, we have the crisis of, of Russian uh, aggression in Ukraine. Um, uh, the fact, as Anton says, we are funneling vast amounts of money every day into Putin's war chest. We have a fuel poverty crisis. Uh, in 2020, the EU did a survey which found that 8% of Europeans were unable to properly heat their homes. Uh, with the fuel prices as they are, and specifically the gas prices, because we're in a gas crisis rather than generalized energy crisis, it's worth saying, um, that's going to be much higher. But we're talking well north of 50 million Europeans. Um, and we have the ongoing crisis of climate change, which is a, a very immediate crisis. The IPCC's um, report last week says we need to make immediate and deep emissions reductions to have a hope of sticking to the 1.5 degree target, which we are far off track for right now, and that we need to use far less fossil fuels. Um, 
Europe gets approximately 40% of its gas from Russia and imports as it stands. That's vastly larger than any of our other sources of gas. Um, this is a few years out of date, but yeah, you can see there Norway uh, doesn't really even come close as the, as the second largest. And Europe's had a choice about this. Um, there have been decision points uh, in 2006, 2009, uh, when Russia turned off the gas, and in uh, 2014, in the annexation of Crimea, where um, there were calls that, with even more urgency, Europe should be following the path of energy efficiency and switching to renewables and reducing our reliance on Russian gas, particularly oil as well, but gas especially. Um, and instead, uh, the European Union went down a path of, of diversification, as they called it, which is finding more sources of gas than just um, Russia. And you can see from this chart that actually Europe's gas demand has stayed almost level over the past two decades. And uh, the dark blue uh, bar in the center, Russia's part of that um, demand, um, has increased. Uh, from about 2005, Russia supplied 20-something percent of Europe's gas, it's now up to 40 percent. So you can see that our reliance and our continued reliance on gas has basically led us to this even greater dependence on Russia than we had before. In my view, that's a total failure of policy. Um, as Anton says, this means that we are paying a vast amount every month into, into Putin's war chest, Depends somewhat on the price as to how much this works out to per day. It was, uh, you know, around 300 million euros. When the spot price is high, you're encroaching on a billion euros. Um, this is a vast amount, and it, uh, and to put it the other way around, if Europe depends on 40% of its gas uh, for Russia, from Russia, Russia um, depends on 70% of its export gas exports going to Europe. So Russia is equally dependent on Europe to sell its gas. Um, and uh, to put that in another term, oil and gas revenue makes up a third of go Russian government income. So this is really directly fueling um, Russia's war machine. And that's been made possible by physical infrastructure. Um, you can see with this map, the scale of the kind of oil pipelines spreading from, from Russia into Europe. And those have only grown, obviously, um, many be familiar with the uh, nearly completed um, pipeline evading Ukraine and going to Germany. Um, these pipelines have been a creation, both of Gazprom and the Russian gas industry, but very much of the European gas industry as well, who've pushed for these pipelines to continue being made. And we're surrounded by gas infrastructure, especially in a country like the UK, where I am, where we have gas infrastructure in our very homes. We have, I mean, I have a gas cooker and I have a, a gas boiler. And until we can get rid of that infrastructure running down our streets and in our homes that we're dependent on, we're, it's going to be hard to change the situation. And this hasn't happened by accident. Uh, the fossil fuel industry has pushed very hard to keep gas as kind of the last fossil fuels. They've spread this messaging that gas, natural as they would prefer to call it, fossil gas as I would prefer to call it, um, is a cleaner, is a partner to renewables and is, is a bridge fuel is the term that's been used, something you can switch to from coal, for example, or heavy fuel oil, before then switching to genuinely renewable sources. Um, and these are just some of the images you get from the fossil fuel industry. And it really is their last stand. Um, oil and coal have lost political legitimacy, I would say. And gas has kind of lingered as this idea, especially in some populations, as a cleaner kind of fuel, which is not unintentional, has been created. But um, to respond to climate change and to have a chance of staying within 1.5 degrees of global warming, we need to reduce gas consumption this decade by 40%. Like we're, we're too late to be building a new oil and gas infrastructure. Um, we need to be radically reducing our, relation, uh, our reliance on gas. Um, but nevertheless, the EU has continued and still does continue to fund um, gas infrastructure projects, um, particularly projects that are international uh, gas pipelines or LNG import terminals that are designated as projects of common interest. And we found that since 2013, 5 billion euros in taxpayer funds have gone to these projects. In addition, they received fast-tracked regulatory approval, um, 
overwhelming preference uh, over arguments about environmental concerns and so on. And again, this hasn't happened by accident. The fossil gas lobby in Europe is very powerful, um, has spent a lot of money trying to, to make this the case. Uh, according to their disclosures, uh, in Brussels, they spent uh, collectively around 300 million euros lobbying um, since 2010. That's worked out into hundreds of meetings with senior EU officials, which is what this refers to, uh, EU uh, commissioners, directors general, and their cabinets above. And they are worked into the very decision-making process. Uh, Anton mentioned Ento, ENSO E earlier. Um, there is also an ENSO G. It's an awful acronym, I know, but it's the European Network of System uh, of Transmission System Operators of Gas. So that's the companies that run big pipelines um, and big infrastructure. A lot of companies you might be familiar with in, in your own area. Um, they uh, are built into the process of what gets funding and what the future gas demand is projected to be. Uh, that work is done by NSOG for the European Commission, um, and they uh, are able to direct where money can be spent. No project can be funded unless NSOG says it should be funded. Um, and their projections for gas demand have been uh, consistently high um, over time. Um, just a quick aside, you too can track uh, European gas industry lobbying. Uh, we created a uh, Twitter bot called the EU Gas Detector that tweets every time a senior EU official discloses meeting a gas industry lobbyist. Um, it also queues up a free information request, which I filed. So you can go to Ask the EU, uh, which is a platform for free information requests in Brussels. Uh, and if you Google my name, you will find uh, records for every uh, gas industry lobbying meetings since we started up this Twitter bot. Um, and then I'll bring up to a story we published um, just two weeks ago. We looked at what we see as, uh, as the gas industry's aligned interests with Russia. Both have been keen to keep Europe hooked on gas. Um, that has, has led to this continued dependence on Russian gas supply. Um, as Anton says, there are shared uh, investments in pipelines into Europe and uh, projects in Russia, um, not to mention long-term contracts and so on. And we asked uh, Eurogas and Gas Infrastructure Europe whether they would back the EU leaders' proposed plans to end uh, European dependence on Russian gas by 2027, and both rejected that idea. Eurogas uh, says that they love some elements of, of the plan about uh, green gases, which we'll get onto in a moment, um, but they were still analyzing it. Gas Infrastructure Europe deflected and said uh, they, their members are great on uh, diversifying gas supplies. Um, what was striking looking into it is that Gazprom Germania, which is um, a Gazprom subsidiary, has been a member of Gas Infrastructure Europe and at no point has been chucked out. Um, I should say though that they were taken over by the German national regulator 10 days ago. Um, and in Eurogas's case, one of their members was this very strange group called the Russian Gas Society, which represents the majority of the Russian gas industry um, and was headed by the chap pictured, whose name is Pavel Zavalny. He is um, Putin's top energy lawmaker. He chairs the Energy Committee in the State Duma and voted in favor of recognizing the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics um, preceding the war. Um, and to put this in context, uh, Kadri Simpson, the EU's top energy official, uh, scheduled to speak at Eurogas's annual conference, spoke at Gas Infrastructure Europe's last week. Um, and someone like Pavel Zavalny, a top Russian official, would have been rubbing shoulders with her at that annual conference um, and able to lobby her um, had, he, had Russian gas society not been suspended by Eurogas earlier in March. But that has been the situation for many years. Russian gas society has been a member of, since 2006. These links are long standing. Um, and this isn't going away. The gas industry is still maintaining that we need the infrastructure we have, uh, that we can transfer onto green gases like hydrogen and biomethane, which I can, I can talk about more. Suffice to say, Gazprom said last year that they would expect Russia to be the world's biggest supplier of hydrogen by 2030. So this would not do away with our dependence on gas more generally, and certainly not on Russian gas anytime soon. Um, Instead, we need to switch to genuinely sustainable solutions as rapidly as possible. The good news is that that's now 
cheaper than ever. Uh, you can see from this chart, which is UK prices, admittedly, but um, fairly representative, that wind and solar power generation is vastly cheaper than gas at this point. Um, and according to a recent study, um, by following straightforward measures that we should be doing anyway around uh, electrification, energy efficiency, installing uh, new renewables, um, we can get rid of our dependence on Russian gas by uh, 2025. And other groups like the IEA have proposed uh, detailed plans for how uh, we can get off Russian gas in time for winter, um, whether uh, we need to because we apply sanctions, which we should, or um, if uh, Russia cuts off the supply. So this is a matter of urgency and we desperately need to take these measures immediately and not lock ourselves into further deployments, reliance on fossil fuels in the decades to come. Hats off to you for bringing together this unique combination of expertise and for giving us the opportunity to understand uh, key energy challenges faced by Ukraine today from the perspective of players on the ground in Ukraine, from the perspective of a really, really important NGO that has brought uh, key information to the larger purview, and also from the perspective of energy ethics. Uh, when I think about the combination of organizations that are brought to the table in this discussion, I can only say that the organizers have been extremely thoughtful and smart about this because many of the issues we are looking at here cannot be looked at simply from a perspective of um, pure economics or technology, they also involve at different levels ethical issues and issues having to do with the larger historical context um, of the situation. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, when I was told that I had 12 minutes at nine in the morning US time to talk, I realized that there's nothing really I can present in this uh, time frame, I have been working on Ukrainian energy issues for more than 20 years. So since this is, this is the first time that I engage with your community, and since I love working with young people, um, I'm just gonna show you a little bit what I have done in my research related to Ukraine, the concepts and issues. These are all issues um, that should somehow be in our radar, especially as academics, as we try to make academic sense of what is happening every day on the ground and still have to produce PhD dissertations or books or articles that go beyond the concrete um, timeframe. Uh, and also a lot of the things that I have been working on, especially in, in my latest book, are basically the background that you need to understand, for example, the sanctions and sanctions of effectiveness, sanctions, dodging issues that Anton and also uh, Barnaby have been um, talking about. So I'm going to try to move to my share screen and share with you a little bit of what I have done. Um, and hopefully um, that can lead to some uh, further discussions. Um, so when I started to work on, on energy, in Ukraine. It happened almost by chance. I'll, maybe I'll tell you the story some other time. It happened at the Ukrainian Research Institute. But I was very unhappy with the idea of, with the phrase Russian energy weapon. Now, now, 25 years later, I can say, yes, there was a Russian energy weapon. But the way this phrase was used in the US was a very simplistic way that really did not help. And when I started working um, on Ukrainian energy, I uh, realized that it was really unfair to countries like Ukraine or other post-Soviet states to discuss them simply as objects of Russian energy policy. We needed to understand them as subjects. Um, and of course, the issue of not considering Ukraine as an object, as a subject of history, is a long-standing issue. And this is exactly what Vladimir Putin is trying to do today by obliter seeking to obliterate Ukraine. So in my research, I tried to, at that time, try to look at this black box, at what was happening inside those quote unquote energy dependent states. Um, and I did a lot of this. I wrote three books that basically dealt with different aspects of this black box. I'm happy to say that two of those uh, came to light because I also, like Leila, was the recipient of a Marie Curie a fellowship, uh, which I held at the University of Helsinki, Alexandria Institute, and thanks to Marie Curie, I was able to finally finish two books I had been writing for many years. Um, 
and in, in that um, cycle of work, I looked a lot at the issue of the winners and losers of different energy policies, in particular, winners and losers of different ways of managing the relationship with Russia, again, very much related to ethics questions, and in particular, issues of corruption and hijacking of energy policy. So my first book in this, in what turned out to be a series, looking in hindsight, was a book basically totally devoted to energy corruption in Ukraine. Um, fortunately, the people who were in power in Ukraine at that time um, did not read it, or at least did not find me, because I wouldn't be here, probably. Um, and um, in this work, um, I understood that you can use energy policy to improve your energy situation or that of your population, but you can also use it for other things. For example, as a currency in intra-oligarchic balancing, uh, which is what we saw in Ukraine, certainly until 2006 and to some extent until 2014 as well. Um, second book in this series, which was a, a bigger book, which took me many years to, to, to finish, um, was a book in which I compared, I tried to understand how different political systems in three quote unquote energy dependent post-Soviet states affected the way they, are, they dealt with their energy relationship with Russia. I compared the case of Ukraine, the case of Belarus, and the case of Lithuania. Lithuania is again in a radar, <laughs> small Lithuania, because of course Lithuania is the first EU country that is um, saying we are not going to be importing Russian gas anymore. And uh, through the work I did in this book, I certainly understand the background to this and how Lithuania already in the um, 2000 was a leader in this area, but I also uh, can say that I understood the complexities of replacing Russian natural gas, including uh, by LNG. But what I mainly learned through this book is that it's not only your political system that will determine how you manage your energy dependency, but that there is actually a feedback loop. And, it, and in each of these three countries, the way that dependency was managed, the way the rents associated with that dependency was managed actually came to shape the political system as well. Uh, a third book in, that, in this series, let's say the last book in this series, uh, look at this issue specifically in the case of Belarus and with a focus on oil refining. And what I did in this book, I have also spent a lot of time doing research in Belarus. Uh, I looked at how the Lukashenko regime used both energy technology and discursive politics to do three things, to guarantee income for the state and for keeping alive that authoritarian regime. Second, to create a system of reward of certain domestic players, even in a country like Belarus, which is very centralized on, on the uh, strongman. And third, to surprisingly for many, kind of manage its relationship with Russia in a way that perhaps may be surprising to those who have usually looked at Belarus through the framework of a client state. Now, a lot of this, after looking so much at this issue from the perspective of governance and corruption, I understood that there were many players that benefited from the relationship, but that this was much more than about corruption. And that's how I started to work on my latest book, which was published um, last year. And in this book, I take a much uh, broader approach to the issue of what I call threat and temptation in energy relations between players uh, from Russia, from Ukraine, and from the European Union. I do this um, by looking at the entire value chain. So I say you cannot simply look at supply to look at this. You need to look at the entire value chain. I do this by following three molecules from Siberia to Ukraine to the European Union. And in doing this, my main um, academic question, scientific question, as the one here in the middle, is about materiality. And this builds upon a lot uh, also on the work I do with my study group in Germany. And basically the question is, how does the materiality of different energy goods affect what you can do with this? Um, so it's a book that works at different levels. Um, it's also a book that seeks to go beyond the purely academic level. And mainly it seeks to empower the reader to understand the technologies that are key for understanding both Ukraine's key role 
in the entire system of Soviet and Russian energy exports, so Ukraine's role in Russian energy chains, the different reasons why Ukraine wanted to remain part of those Russian energy chains as key transit state, as opposed to having transit sent through uh, Nord Stream, and also uh, understanding how this is um, the use of these different types of energy also supported different uh, levels of power, not only from external powers, but also through domestic players. And this is very clear, for example, in the discussion of coal and steel in, uh, in chapter six of the book. Um, key uh, concepts in this book, um, I'm not going to go through all of that in detail, but a lot of the things that I discuss here are really important for understanding how we got to the current war and how sanctions and trying to move away from Russian energy is so difficult. Um, and the reality is that historically, um, we had a perfect storm having to do both with contradictions in EU, EU policy, having to do with a very deep historical relationship between European energy players and min gas from export and then gas from having to do with the actual co-creation of an entire system of energy supply. All the maps that you saw, for example, um, that Barnaby was showing about the natural gas network, that network was co-created um, in the early 1980s by Western European and Soviet players. And you need to understand that at the cultural level to understand why it was so hard to move away from that uh, dependency. Um, so uh, to, 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 to end, um, I would like to say that as a person who has been working on Ukraine for many years, I have many contradictory feelings at this point, mainly of impotence, grief, but also as a scholar, I wonder what is next in our research, energy research on Ukraine. Of course, I can write a tweet and I write many of them, please join my, my, my Twitter account. I can write a newspaper article, but how about our larger projects? What can they focus on? Um, what, what will we work on when uh, Russia is destroying part of Ukraine's energy economy like it is destroying my two flagship steel factories in Mariupol that are the, that are the heroes of, of chapter six in my book. What research do we do? Am I at fault? Because I wrote a book about uh, Ukrainian energy corruption that maybe people use as an excuse to uh, avoid Ukraine. So these are many, many questions. But uh, to finish, I would like to say that Ukrainian, Ukraine's role in the world market, Ukraine's role in commodities, in energy, in other natural resources, in agricultural resources, will continue either through its presence or through its absence. And we are feeling that feeling that now from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. Um, thank you. And uh, please join my Twitter if you want to uh, get a sense of the latest events um, as we try to make sense of them. Thanks a lot.